Good evening all. I'm just sorting out the uh, board uh, for live stream Comkins Crusher as well as chess based server. Um, I hope the board is getting to be okay. Is the board okay? Perfect. No blue line at the top. Everything's okay. Everyone's happy with the board on live stream. And um, yes, no blue line at the top. Centered, everything okay, good. So we can start. So I thought I'd look at some Bronstein games uh, this week. Uh, I don't think we've covered Bronstein in a live stream so far. I know um, other presenters on the chess base server anyway are covering uh, the very uh, good tournament, the Tatar still, which I might do one or two videos on YouTube uh, there is there is a Colson video on YouTube for one of his wins um, but uh, yeah let's go to some classic games here in this session so um, yeah I'm a fan of David Bronstein because I have one of his books actually the Sorcerer's Apprentice by my bed at the moment and he was into all sorts of avenues of chess including actually commentary on games playing chess computers um, playing blitz which he called um active chess he uh, was ha very dynamic style he experimented a lot with openings playing what many will consider very risky openings okay so i thought he's quite an exciting character actually and you know some argue he could have beaten uh you know botvinik in in the world championship match but he did hold botvinik to a draw match score equal uh so um so let's have a look at one of the early David Bronstein games, 1941. And this this is one of the picks on Wiki, which the notes for this, this interesting game are that the 17-year-old Bronstein meets the chairman of the USSR Classification Committee, uh, who had just awarded him the title of Master. The youth shows that it was the right decision. So okay he was black so d4 knight f6 and after c4 we see d6 actually the normal way to get into a king's engine would be g6 but d6 is very interesting for an early e5 so this is not standard king's engine territory this was a favorite of this metinov uh, um this early e5 here inviting white to try and exchange off queens which i think is harmless for black um old indian thank you eight arms yes <laughs> okay old indian so um knight f3 was played actually and then knight bd7 and and now uh the white bishop is fianchettoed with g3 so g6 black also fianchettoes their bishop um okay and now both sides castle and now b3 so about to fianchetto the queen's bishop as well so um rookie eight e3 supporting the center c6 okay so so far what is black doing black is creating a strong point maybe on e5 maybe queen c7 might be considered or queen more active queen a5 or a5 first queen b6 there's a few possibilities for black in fact after queen c2 a seemingly very active queen a5 was used and maybe you might imagine that in some lines this queen might cheekily go across to the king's side if it takes or well, something happens for e4 and the queen could travel across to some attacking squares maybe after a4 the move knight f8 was played so where is this knight rerouting is it really gonna is it gonna play like h5 knight h7 or knight e6 later maybe ed first after bishop a3 actually bishop f5 so the queen now goes to b2 and now uh, david plays rook ad8 so okay he's got his rooks nicely connected 
and his control of e4 is quite good here. There's a lot of pieces in contact with e4. And if we look at some old Fisher games, often control of e4 was a prelude to an attack in this kind of King's Engine attack type system. And here actually, it's got that kind of pattern. So this is way back in 1941, before the rise of Fisher, but it looks kind of Fisher-esque if you look at some early Fisher games. He did kind of overprotect e4 first as black, and then strive later for a kingside attack. Often with moves like this, exchange off the light square bishop, and attack the king side. So here we see it in 1941, similar sort of plan. Actually h5 is not needed for a knight uh, to get in contact with these two squares. In fact, this maneuver is also possible to get contact with two critical squares around white's king. So knight e6 was played here. And I guess we should look at what would happen if white played knight takes e4. Is that at all possible? Knight takes e4, knight takes e4. I guess simply knight takes d4 is possible here. Uh, so threatening knight f3 check, winning the queen. So if ed, bishop takes. So that's not really on or pleasant for white. So here knight e6 is possible. White just played b4. Queen retreats to c7. So we have here an iron grip actually on e4 with things like h5 and knight g5 being a bit fisher like. If you've looked at old Fisher games, you might recognize this attacking pattern. First, secure your central control, then go for the king. Rook db1. Okay, so White's queenside operations might one day you know, achieve threatening proportions for undermining the black king side. But for the moment, black is countering with crude but effective intentions. With his next move, queen d7, he sets up a battery on the diagonal. So something like knight g5 and bishop h3 try and weaken these key squares around the king. c5 now, and in fact, not wasting time with d5, but immediately playing knight g5. c takes d, and now going in for the light squares, undermining now white's king safety. First, to exchange off this, and it's really going to get into the white king position. Bishop h1, not wasting time taking d6. So an aggressive king's engine player might often consider this and other things to speed up the attack. Um, why go for a pawn where you can go for the king? Queen f5 goes for the king. Things like knight g4 are now on the cards. Hitting f2. Okay, it's getting to be very dangerous. Queen, sorry, knight e2, as though knight f4 might be useful to attack the bishop and block any g4 attack. Seems like a logical move. Knight d5. So what does knight d5 do, you might ask? Okay, so the bishop's got scope here. Maybe knight e3 could be on the cards one day or knight f3 check is gonna be dangerous. So it seems there's a lot of pressure building up here. For the moment, after b5 is played, bishop g4 now, just attacking that knight. And another point of knight d5 is revealed that actually knight f4 could be answered by taking. Let's have a look, because in the game, white seemed to basically res essentially resign with his next move, this seems a terrible move to have to play king f1. So you might ask, why not knight f4? And here, okay, so knight takes f4. Might be really good here. Takes, check, let's say, here. And it looks as though e3 is going to be crushing. It's threatening queen d3 now. It's horrible. The king position... I think it's being really heavily undermined here in this position. Would everyone agree that this is a strong continuation after knight f4, simply to take the knight um, and play the check? 
on h3 that seems stronger than knight f3 um, although this bishop would be dead here admittedly but you want to open lines of attack um, so maybe it's better just keep things open go, go for the option of shredding open lines so knight h3 check and e3 would seem crushing so in the game let's go back so after bishop g4 in fact king f1 was chosen and um, now in fact king f1 walks into a horrible tactic which I hope you've all spotted if I give you 10 seconds starting from now what can black play here the weakness of the last move 10 seconds starting from now Okay, the weakness of the last move, this pawn's pin, so I hope with another 10 seconds all of you will be screaming out a clearly crushing move. <laughs> no, not knight f3. <laughs> this pawn is pinned, that's the clue. Although knight f3 might be winning as well, I suppose, because it does threaten bishop h3 mating. Yes, yes, knight e3, thank you. Knight e3, a lot of you calling out knight e3 now. So knight e3 was the move played. I assume it's one of the strongest moves. Uh, and now knight f3 check. And it's looking very unpleasant for white, so much so that white resigns here. Um, so the king can't move, so let's say knight takes. Let's say pawn takes. And it's slaughter time, really. Let's picture this position. It's pretty cruel that the white king has been crushed and the and the white bishop on h1 is terrible. Okay, so that's an early David Bronstein game. Let's have a look in overview and summary. So an old engine with great effect. The strategy of overprotecting the e4 square forms the basis of a very strong irresistible attack. You see things piling up on e4 positionally. And white really didn't get much counterplay going on the queen side. d6 was let to drop and sp sped up the black attack, leaving that d6 pawn instead plowing into the white king position. Um, you might also ask, well, what if actually, while we're at it, knight c1? I think here again um it's looking unpleasant i think knight takes knight f3 takes and there might actually be um a lot of horrible things on the cards like knight takes e3 and f2 check this looks fairly crushing and at minimum this bishop is also terrible so in the game it was it was a bit sad to see king f1 but uh white was probably uh, utterly lost here anyway so uh, let's go on to another game. Now, Wiki describes this next game as a stunning original tactical onslaught which attracted worldwide acclaim. So this next game, again, David Bronstein was playing black against Ludic Pashman, who I had a very good middle game book actually from Ludic Pashman, a very good writer on the middle game I'm sure he, he did he write many chess books does anyone know I have one of his books at least so anyway he was white this was in 1946 Prague Czech Republic so d4 knight f6 after c4 again a repeat of this old Indian d6 okay so knight c3 e5 old Indian just for those who haven't seen uh, YouTube videos about this one of the players in my league one of the strongest whoops um, this is a harmless line usually because c6 and then King c7 and you know this was a favorite of this Metanov this is harmless and we've also seen Petrosian play this with great success this line 
So if you're wondering about d takes e, it's pretty harmless for white generally to do that. Uh, so knight f3 was played here, knight bd7. And now white fianchettos, black fianchettos. And again, this queenside fianchetto is chosen b3. Rook e8. And the nature of the game is now fundamentally different to the other one because e4 is played. Allowing black to seemingly play, you know, this aggressive dynamic move, e takes d4. That was chosen. Knight takes d4. So will black be faced with this weak d6 pawn on the semi open file? That's often kind of makes the position very interesting and dynamic. This d6 pawn. Is it a weakness? Is it an exploitable weakness, more importantly? Knight c5 was played. After rook e1. You know, black's counter pressure on e4 is clearly evident. a5 to discourage b4s. Bishop b2. And now a bit of a surprise, maybe to some of you, that usually maybe you consider c6 and queen b6. Now this was perhaps in the infancy of this kind of system, but actually a4 was chosen. chosen even before the queen was given scope for a5 after rook c1 now c6 okay now the bishop goes to a1 and now black simply dissolved the a pawn with ab ab and now queen b6 so there's a bit of pressure bearing down on the queen's side there's potential pressure on the diagonal h3 now knight f d seven. Okay, where is this knight going? Is it, you know, if any knight e five? Surely you might ask. There's f four on the cards. Actually, the knight is going to f eight, f eight, where it might maybe challenge this knight on d four, or maybe use this other idea of h five, h four, knight h seven. Maybe those are the two main possibilities of knight f eight. It seems. After king h2, in fact, h5 was chosen. Rook e2, and now h4, offering a pawn to weaken white on the dark squares. Rook d2, as though d6 is going to be a weakness. So we see this kind of theme. You know, this is implied theme that black is going to get both dark square counterplay and pressure on e4. In return, there's going to be this apparently uh, weak pawn. But um, the big question, which is often asked by you know David Bronstein and emphasised in many of his um, annotations, you know sometimes this d6 pawn is just simply not very exploitable. So um, David Bronstein is black, yes. So now actually, we have a startling exchange sacrifice, which is part of Black's dark square campaign. He actually sacrifices the exchange with rook takes a1, which may come to many of you as a shock. But actually, there's a forcing sequence here now. Bishop takes d4, and the point is revealed that there's going to be a fork with knight takes b3, hitting a1 and b3. After rook takes d4, knight takes b3. OK. So d6 drops, but um, now. The big surprise is that it's not knight takes a1 that is played. So black here um, is content to be an exchange down. Okay, black, David Bronstein, in fact, offers the knight as well. He plays queen takes f2. Now, if the knight is taken, then check would win the rook on d6. So this is now a very tricky position. OK. So rook a2 is used, which apparently defends g2, but it does offer g3, which is taken. Queen takes g3 check. King h1. And actually, the c3 knight is dropping now. Queen takes c3. So now black looks to be materially winning. So that was pretty neat. 
But is there a pin now with Rook A3? Okay. Fireworks continue a little bit. That wasn't the end of the display. So with this pinned knight, now again a bit, a chunk is taken out. Another chunk is taken out of white's king safety with bishop takes h3. So again, white is going, it would seem a little bit material up with rook takes b3. But again, more king safety is taken away. Bishop takes g2, king takes. And although the exchange down, after queen takes c4, he's collected four pawns for the exchange. Four, he's got five pawns versus the one pawn. So black is materially winning. It's not bad to have four pawns for the exchange. Rook d4, the queen returns to e6. So now there's also possibilities of h3, but at the moment the rook's covering it. Or is it, after rook takes b7, h3 check becomes possible, but is not played straight away. In fact, rook a8 is now played, just to try and get the rook to the seventh. And after queen e2, in fact, h3 check is played here. And white actually resigned here. Now, if king h2, queen e5 check would win the rook, would win the rook. Um, if king g1, then, then rook a1 check is pretty strong. And if say king f2, there's the, the king's really had it on the dark squares. It's it's real trouble. So basically white resigned after h3 check. Um, are you all convinced this is a completely lost position for white? The exchange up. I hope you are. Um, the king's safety has just been shot to pieces here, bit by bit. Starting, starting from this rook takes a1 combination. What about rook takes a2? Sorry, at what move? Rook a2 check. Well, h3 was played and, and white resigned here. Well, there was rook d2, you see. You know, in this position here, there was rook d2. Rook d2. Yeah? So what he played is, I mean, this this might be winning anyway. It seems all winning for black here. Okay. So let's do an overview and summary. So remember, this game was picked out by Wiki. Um, so what? just to remind ourselves what Wiki said, a stunning original tactical onslaught which attracted worldwide acclaim. So let's have a look at it again. An old engine defense. And... Um, it does seem like a very dynamic play from black. And one intriguing little nuance maybe to note is not c6 and queen b6, but a4 immediately. And it seems that this rook is destined to sacrifice the exchange later. If we look at back at the game, an exchange sack is lurking in the background. And this knight fd7 in retrospect is preparing a combination based on rook takes a1, bishop d4 and knight b3. So rook b1 protects b3 for the moment, knight f8, but it's on the cards, this idea, this mechanism of bishop d4 and knight b3. And um, it's played now, this is the point where rook takes a1 is played here. So bishop d4, knight b3, the fireworks begin, but Queen F2 now coordinates with this pawn for a dark square campaign. Okay, so check, taking, going into a self pin, but tearing apart White's king. King's really weak. The exchange down, but winning just very easily now after H3 check. Okay, that was quite a dynamic attacking game. Let's go on to another. Okay. Now in this game, Wiki describes it as Bronstein offers a far reaching exchange sacrifice, which ties black up leading to a beautiful strategic, strategical win. 
So this game in question with a beautiful strategical win is the one I'm going to put on next. So against Isaac Bolzlavsky, who was famous for the Bolzlavsky hole in the Sicilian defense, when in the Sicilian defense you weaken d5, you know, with e5, Bolzlavsky hole. And so Bolzlavsky was one of the hypermoderns actually, you know, in, in the 60s and 70s. And so the Russians were carving out new dynamic systems. And it's quite interesting, he's, you know, this is a key game against Bolzlavsky. So, um, Basically, uh, d4 was played by David. I'm going to flip the board again because David Bronstein was white. And um, Isaac Bolzavsky, uh played Grunfeld defense, so d5. And um, c takes d. This is a very trendy line was played. So c5, all theory, bishop c4, very trendy stuff. And this was all seen later in the Karpov Kasparov matches, this line with knight e2. This was a favourite of Anatoly Karpov, this line. But with bishop e3 being played a lot, then we saw stuff like bishop g4 or knight c6, bishop g4, endless variations of that in Karpov Kasparov. But here actually, black played uh, c takes d4 c takes d4 knight c6 and one of the things about this now is that white has an interesting possibility coming up which we do see in more modern part became part of grunfeld defense theory later on uh, this idea coming up of a very powerful exchange sack after bishop e6 namely played d5 but remember this was 1950 so sacrificing the rook like this to weaken these dark squares, I think this was quite novel for the time. So offering an exchange sack does put black under great pressure. Another aspect is this knight's a bit of an issue unless it can claw into c4, but really things like bishop h6 later, and this center could be very dangerous for the black king. So. Bishop takes a1, accepting the exchange sack. Queen takes a1. And because there's a pin on the d-pawn, actually, black doesn't need to rush to move the bishop. Actually, he plays f6, which seems to blunt the white queen on the diagonal. But bishop h6 anyway. Check. King moves. And now restoring the pin on d3 with rook fd8. Okay, now the queen is attacked with rook b1. So what is the compensation here uh, for white? And how many of you would like to have the position with the white pieces here? Do you think it's favorable for white or do you think you're just the exchange down? So let's take a quick poll. If I give you um, 10, 15 seconds, what would you say would you prefer white or black in this position so this is at move 18 white or black eight times you say white any other takers So you'd like to be the exchange down. <clears throat> so Eric says long term white because of bishop on h6. George says black knight d4 is pretty strong. Serum 84 chess place gives I always give the exchange for this sort of attack and get the black squares. Anyone else? Raf. Probably black. Black can consolidate. Okay. Okay, if black can consolidate, will black be able to consolidate? Okay, bishop d2 targets not only the knight, but also maybe introduces bishop b4 now as a skewer. Uh, b6 secures the knight, but bishop b4 anyway, queen c7. Now the queen's attacked again. And now we have queen b1, which threatens bishop takes a5. 
because we've got a pin on b7 at the moment so the queen's protected and actually isn't there a tactical accident after this because also the pin has been defused d takes e6 as well as bishop takes a5 is on the cards oh dear what has happened here d takes e6 white's material up where did black just blunder black has just blundered hasn't he let's go through that again so what happened was in this position this was a loose piece because of the pin there was bishop b4 where did the queen move it didn't go over here because a bishop takes e7 and then queen f6 crashing through so it supported e7 then we saw rook c1 the queen's got to support e7 and then we saw this tactic which basically implies bishop a5 and protecting the bishop for d takes e6 so why it's just one material by force so material up now bishop c3 okay knight e5 was played now bishop b5 material up doesn't mind exchanging on e5 bishop d7 closes down the rook from both the default and the use of c8 queen a6 attacking the knight knight moves okay grabs a pawn but now the attack can continue charge h4 so the attack can continue with h5 and, and queen g5 the king is at white's mercy surely now after queen g5 we have a beautiful final move coming up because black has to now parry h5 and queen e7 so he tries to parry both with rook f6 but um i hope um, you guys on chess base are hiding your move score if you go to another tab because i'm going to ask everyone now i'm going to give you 20 seconds can you spot the final killer below move played in this game if i give you 20 seconds starting from now whoa i think someone's mentioned it on live stream <laughs> someone's mentioned it on chess space yes i think i'm gonna have to spill the beans here for the final move of the game queen takes f6 and this pawn is now devastating it's supported by the bishop black resigns here if takes e7 there's no useful check is there to rescue this situation if check maybe you know king h2 again e8 is being pushed through end of game queen takes f6 okay so that was an early example remember in 1950 the groomfield wasn't so evolved as of today this exchange site was brilliant at the time 1950 this exchange sack on a1 it quickly led to black's disaster because maybe you know the queen being subject to attack here and this if this is protected then you know, is this a vulnerability it all came together disastrously for black in this continuation after bishop d2 so perhaps b6 was the critical mistake maybe queen c7 a lot better queen c7 that could have been a critical mistake so b6 could be a critical mistake so now unfortunately bang we have queen b1 winning material the threat of bishop a5 and d takes e6 so without rook takes d3 now being possible so um but it was a nice conversion from this position carrying on with this beautiful final move rook queen takes f6 okay so let's have a look at another game <clears throat> so
So now this game, according to Wiki, this is an interesting game. We have a child prodigy, uh, which David is asked to beat to, to, to stop him, ordered by the state to stop Samuel Rozevsky from winning first prize or something like that, qualifying. It was the Zurich 1953 tournament. Of course, we should all know that David Bronstein did the great annotations book of Zurich 1953. And later there's a rumor that he was disgusted of the possibility of agreed draws between many players. Um, so anyway, there's some controversy about that, but many regard it as one of the greatest annotation books of all time in chess literature. This Zurich 1953. Do many of you own a copy of the book? Because some of the early King's Engine ideas and the weaknesses about D6 are explored in the book. You know, this notion of exploitable weaknesses in the King's Engine is explored. Uh, really, I think I will be ordering this book from Amazon because I'm pleased with the Sorcerer's Apprentice. So it will be a logical thing to get a hold of this book. Okay. So, um,. Samuel Rozevsky playing white. So if we flip the board, uh, so d4, okay, so knight f6, so a king's engine thing, Chetto line. So white's king should be safer than the normal king's engine lines. And of course, in this system, you adapt to the Fianchetto. So you don't usually play knight c6 for e5 and expect this, but instead, you play a different plan. This is much more popular, it seems. Knight BD7. Just just to strike with E5 and try and get C5 for the knight. If D5, you try and get C5 for the knight and often A5 to secure it. E4. Rook E8. And again, we have this dynamic play after H3. E takes, knight takes, knight C5. So again, we've got d6 versus e4. Black's trump card being this pressure on e4. The dark squares in general. You know, maybe later, you know, to smash up the dark squares. d6, if c6, then d6 is often seen as an exploitable target. Rook e1, a5, our queen c2, and then c6. So d6 is, is again the question here. Bishop e3. Okay, knight fd7 here. So is the knight going back to f8 like in the previous game? Rook ad1. And even though white hasn't played actually b3, David Bronstein still plays a4 here. Maybe it's almost punishing white for not playing b3 anyway uh, to be able to capture f b3 and gives queen a5 as a possibility. So knight d e2, queen a5, offering, offering d6. So question, why can't d6 be taken here? In the game, bishop f1 was played. So who knows the answer here? If rook takes d6, does anyone know what would happen? here anyone anyone got any ideas I'll give you 20 seconds starting from now I'm not really sure myself <laughs> actually Okay, a couple of you have suggested knight e5. All right, that does hit c4. That does seem to be a forcing move. And what of b3 here? Isn't that possible? b3? Oh, pardon me. Pardon me. Knight takes e4. Sorry. Someone's mentioned knight takes e4. Yes, there's a queen attacking the rook here. And the, the rook. Blimey. 
but in this position it doesn't work does it bishop takes e4 doesn't work in that position does it so let's go back to knight e5 um b3 Oh dear, this is going to be a mystery of the evening now. Sorry, what's what's the situation here? Is this the wrong continuation? Bishop takes h3. Bishop takes h3. Knight f3 check. Yes, very nice. So king f1. King f1 here. Is it knight takes e4? Because we've got we've got coordination on e1. So we're all agreed this is crushing, yeah? <laughs> so, oh sorry, knight takes e1. Or just simply knight takes e1. Isn't knight takes e4 quite strong as well? Knight takes e1 looks pretty good as well. For knight takes e4, very good, very good. Blimey, that looks crushing. Really, that looks crushing. So this is what happens. You see, that's why d6 is not such an exploitable weakness. Um, so that just shows, you know, d6 is perhaps illusionary in some variations because black has dynamic play quite often. Um, so c4 is a bit of of a loose tempo gainer the dot the light squares are a bit loose and this sort of possibility is very interesting um, so okay so bishop f1 knight e5 anyway knight d4 and these squares are covered it would seem a3 Now white evicts the knight on e5, f4, knight goes back, b3, and it looks again, isn't white solid here for the moment? Is white solid? Well actually black's got a good dark square grip, b4 is quite good. So he plays knight a6 as though, you know, maybe uh, knight b4, okay, bishop f2. There's also the c5 square to use, so knight dc5. So again, there's renewed pressure on 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 the center. So knight b4. All this looks pretty good pressure that black is exerting. Rook e3. As though white's trying to consolidate the position. Okay, knight b4. Queen goes to e2. There's nothing. There's no knockout blow now, and it looks as though white is preparing e5. So black waits for e5, he plays bishop d7, and e5 arrives. e5, which gives white some more squares, maybe. The e4 square could be useful. Undermining c5 could be useful on this diagonal. d takes e5, f takes. Rook a d8. So now this diagonal looks a bit tasty for white. So this next move, I think, g4 prepares bishop h4 to put pressure on on this diagonal after knight e6 bishop h4 is chosen knight takes d4 rook takes d4 and the rook cannot move now because of rook takes d7 so counter attack on on the rook queen c5 it's a bit of a complicated game this one rook d e4 and the rook still doesn't move. Instead, David goes for this. He's going to go for that. Bishop h6. On to king h1. Bishop e6. And in fact, white doesn't fancy now bishop takes. He plays actually instead g5 to block the bishop. 
Bishop g7. So how do we evaluate this position after rook f4? Which side do you prefer? If I give you 20 seconds here, do you prefer white or do you prefer black? So 20 seconds starting from now, white or black? Sounding like an optician there, white or black, left or right? <laughs> You prefer white, Lasker too. You prefer white. Okay. Um, George prefers black. Anyone on chess base server? Black for sure. Well, how do we evaluate this? Where do we start? Is this F file of significance? It seems pretty solid for black with that bishop defending F7. So it doesn't really matter, does it, if even white triples this f7 secure, this bishop's blocked in by the pawn. This knight keep, you know, keeps the pressure on, on the white position. This queen could be dangerous. e5 could be vulnerable. I don't know. The first thing, I'd like the look of black here. But let's go on. Bishop f5. So e5 immediately comes into question now. It's in the firing line of three pieces. Knight e4, and now f6 comes into question. Conversely, it's snapped off. F takes e4, so e5 is definitely secure. We've got enough pieces supporting e5. These guys, all supporting e5 here. Okay, the knight goes to a6. Is it rerouting nicely to a blockade square? No, it stops. That plan stops in its tracks. E6 straight away. No blockade. F takes. Rook takes. Rook F8. So there's a bit of tactical pressure in some variations. Well, it's got to be a bit careful. Rook E7. Bishop d4 doesn't want uh, any rook takes g7s coming in. That could spell doom for the white king, potentially. Rook goes in. Queen f5. Any immediate threats here? I can't see any threats myself, but maybe knight c5 is going to be handy now to attack the rook. Rook e8. And in fact, knight c5 is used. Rook takes d8. Knight takes e6. And the other rook comes off. And king takes f8. So the situation has clarified. The rooks have all come off. g5 still looks loose. The knight and bishop look central. So what about this situation after some smoke has cleared at move 41? Do you prefer white or black here? 20 seconds to evaluate this position, starting from now. Anyone? Black. George says black. White look okay. Lasker two probably black. Okay. It's a long game. This it's a grind. Um, one grandmaster favoured it actually um, in one of his books, How Grandmasters Play. Wiki talks about this game. It's a bit of a grind. David couldn't accept a draw. It's going to be a grind game. Bishop g three. It was ordered by the state to win this game. So queen takes g5. So what was this pawn sack anyway? He's won a pawn here. Because queen e6, he's now got queen g3. He's nabbed the pawn, but it's opposite colored bishops. And he's threatening mate. Check. King goes to e7. So where is the king going? The queen didn't dare take on b7 here. Maybe because of king d6. No, not king d6, queen b8. 
<laughs> that would be a disaster. Okay, let, let's ask this question. Queen takes b7. What does, what does black do here after queen takes b7? Possibly king d8. Then there's no checks, is there? There's a queen g8 friend. There's no check because of this. Okay, so maybe that's why the kings come to the center. So queen g4 was played. Queen c3. And let's go through these moves now. Check. 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 The king is going over the queen side. Queen b2. Queen d4 threatening queen g1. Using the 2 to 1 pawn majority. Check. Creating the passed pawn. King in further safety on the queen side. Why is it popping out again? Queen h2 mate threatened. Check. Check. Queen f3 to d1 looks like a major threat. But actually at the moment there's queen g2. After b4 actually, bishop d4, we have this as the final move of the game. Is this because Samuel Rzeski lost on time? Or is it actually winning for black? That's an interesting one. Yeah, maybe b4 is a bit weak as a target. Is that a cause of resignation here? There is actually g3 on the cards, which would tie white down. And then queen h6 would be pretty nasty. So maybe white did resign here. g3 looks terrible. That seems to be an imminent threat, just g3. I can't see how white can defend this position that easily at all. Um, you know, say uh, c5 check, you know, king a7, and okay, and this looks just grim. There's, there's a threat of queen h6, it looks pretty grim. Maybe he just resigned, he thought it was grim. So, a bit of a grind game, not a glamorous kind of game you usually see on on YouTube it's not a quick win it was a grind game but he had to win he was ordered by the state there's a context behind this game to grind Samuel Rzewski down so this was going to be a long fight and um, somehow he got the better of it um, somehow grinding white down when the rooks came off it seemed the opposite color bishop and pawn ending favored David Bronstein after these rooks came off. Then we get this opposite color bishop and pawn ending and he grounds white down into submission uh, using his passed pawn, securing his king, putting his bishop on a dangerous diagonal and potentially I think the threat of g3 just puts white white's kings down in the end. So let's go on to another game. Um, Okay, so this is against another attacking player, and I believe this has been covered on YouTube. This is one of those glamorous attacking games against Paul Kares, um, who was also kind of a really great attacking uh, player. So against Paul Kares, Gonterberg, 1955, David Bronstein was white. So we have actually in this game a Nimzo Indian defence with e3 which is um in rubenstein's favorite move e3 pretty solid c5 bishop d3 black plays b6 and because black hasn't taken on c3 to double the pawns white can now play knight g2 if he wants to recapture bishop b7 white castles C takes, E takes, and after castles, the first sort of surprise, maybe attacking move, 
disruptive pawn sack d5. So he's getting control, I think, of this square for a knight, potentially, this f5 square. And this was in 1955, and this, this idea is played in, a lot in modern games. This, this pawn sack with d5 to get critical attacking squares. The pawn sack is not accepted. Black leaves the pawn on e6. He ignores this d5. He plays h6. Bishop c2 with crude intentions. You know, maybe queen d3. Knight a6 dispels that because knight c5 if queen d3. There's a slight weakness of the black position. This d6 might be a bit weak. So knight b5. Which carries with it now a threat of a3. If bishop moves back, there's d6. If bishop c5, there's b4. So this is supporting d6. This is getting a look looking a bit horrible. Black decides to take that pawn. E takes d5. After a3, bishop e7. Now knight g3. So we've got that f5 square for the knight, potentially. Black snaps up another pawn, which at least stops any queen d3 use from this pawn. But now comes a surprising bishop sack. Bishop takes h6, leaving black's king exposed. So g takes h6 and queen d2. So how is black defending this h6 if king g7 is knight f5? So he has to lose another pawn. But it looks as though you know, hasn't black got defensive resources here? Couldn't he play f5 to at least block the bishop from this uh, threat of mate? So f5. But he's losing yet another pawn now. Knight takes f5. So here you've sacrificed a bishop and a couple of pawns earlier. You've got some of your pawns back. In fact, you're a pawn up here. So what side do you guys take if I give you 20 seconds here from this position? Do you prefer white or do you prefer black? 20 seconds starting from now. White, white. Is this going to be unanimous? <clears throat> unanimous. White seems to have a more fun position. This is Kaspar's favourite place for a knight, this f5 square. Very attacking, threatening mates and stuff. Okay, so black actually decides to get rid of that pesky knight with rook takes f5, radical, exchange sack. Knight f8, so is black getting solid? More reserves are put into the attack now with rook ad1. So as if rook d4... So g4 might be coming in. Bishop g5, queen h5. Queen f6. Attacking the bishop. Okay. So knight d6 defends the bishop and attacks this bishop. Bishop c6. Queen g4 now threatens f4, maybe an h4. This bishop's pinned to the king. So the king moves. Bishop e4 now. Okay, Bishop e4. Um, bishop h6. And now that bishop is taken off. And simply queen takes c4, getting another pawn, hitting the knight and the pawn here. So he's getting a lot of pawns. He's two pawns now for the piece. But black's pieces seem to be in disarray. A third pawn for the piece. Three pawns for. Well, actually, the material balance is more complicated than that. Pardon me, it's two rooks and knight. So five, ten, thirteen against five, eight, eleven, fourteen. But the pawns, you know, white's got loads of pawns, three pawns. So rook b eight. Knight e4, 
Black's under a lot of pressure. Rook d6 pins are horrible to deal with. And now comes f4, calmly threatening f5. Queen g4. Queen's attacked again. And again. Inviting a check to tuck the king in on h2. Attacking the queen. The queen just moves. Introducing more threats like queen h5. After rook e8, actually knight h5 is chosen here to try and rob black's defensive resources. Knight e2, as though g3 might be significant, but uh, white takes on g7 anyway, allowing g3 check, queen g3. And here, unfortunately, queen takes g7 would, would seem to be quite dangerous uh, because of queen h5 check. Um, so knight takes f4, white's clearly um, winning, queen f3, it's end of game, after check black resigned here is getting mated now, um, you know if, if king takes, well check is, is just mating black, so he resigned there after the check. So that was interesting anyway. It was a dynamic attacking, attacking uh, game. Uh, let's have a look at that again. So it started from the Rubenstein variation against the Nimzo Indian. So this E3. Then we saw this temporary dislocating pawn sacrifice with the idea of getting a knight to F5, which we see in a lot of modern games, this idea of this D5 pawn sack. Then we saw this very brutal bishop sacrifice happening soon. Bishop takes h6 with the quiet threat it seems of queen d2 shredding black's king safety to bits. Um, I'm not sure knights, knight g4 just play h3 so black's giving up another pawn then giving up the exchange but white collects pawns now even on the other side of the board when he exchanged off this bishop, he started collecting these two pawns on the queen side, then resumes operations on the king side soon. Um, so, quite a brutal game. And um, finally finishing off with rook h6. So that was against Paul Kerr's 1955. Let's have a look at another game. Okay. Now this game, Wiki uh, indicates this Virtuoso game sees Bronstein sacrifice three pawns uh, to open queen side lines into Aloni's king position. Uh, this is one game I've seen the annotations in my Sorcerer's Apprentice book. I've, I've been going through the positions actually more than a couple of times. He talks about icy winds from the north, east, etc. Um, so Bronstein uh, Black, very attacking game in the King's Engine defence. Uh, so very dynamic against the Simish variation. We're going to see here um, that Bronstein writes actually in his book the notion of attacking the centre rather than occupying the centre. And even if it leaves a mighty hole on d5, he's going to attack the centre really hard now after g4. So he takes on d4 and he plays d c5, seemingly leaving horrendous weaknesses in his position. Yeah, I, I recently got the book from Amazon. It's very, very good. Get it from Amazon. And there's two versions. I, I would get the version with, with David Bronstein depicted by an artist in the front. That's That, that, that looks like the nicer version. So knight e5. Uh, so even though d6 is weak, c4 is a source of counterplay here, and b5s. So bishop e2, bishop e6, knight a3 defending c4, knight f d7 offering d6, probably too dangerous here. White castle's queen side, b5. Okay, it looks like vicious counterplay 
has been created. C4 offering another pawn, which is taken. Okay, but the white king's over here. This is all going to be fun. So in queen a5. So we've got things pointing at the white king. Um, we've got lots of potential threats on the horizon. Bishop d4 trying to parry some threats. Rook fc8. As though c3 is on the cards now. Bishop c3. Now comes knight d3 check. Eliminating a key defender with bishop takes c3. C takes d3 and we've opened up another line against the king. Immediate threat of rook takes c3. Actually the queen's defending though a3 at the moment. So rook takes d3. So we're three pawns down now. Three pawns down. Uh, so this is this is an interesting moment for evaluation. So how do you guys evaluate this position? Do you prefer white or do you prefer black? in this position if I give you 20 seconds to evaluate this position here white or black starting from now White Zerodi writes white. Really? You prefer having three pawns? Cloud says I think white can hang on. Is there an implication you prefer white as well? Really? Anyone else? <clears throat> the king is a little bit exposed, yes. Anyone else? Okay, let's carry on. So knight e5 hitting rook, rook e3. Now rook d8 trying to get control of the d5 and d3, maybe for a knight d3 check. Queen e7. Rook d7, as though a battery is going to be accelerated if the rooks do want to play like this or like this or somewhere. Queen f6. Queen c5 hitting the rook again. Maybe threatening rook a3 now, potentially. If the rook comes off c3, then rook a3 is a problem. Knight c2. Now comes check. And white decides here to sacrifice the exchange to relieve some pressure. White sacrifices an exchange with rook takes d3. Rook takes d3. There's still a lot of pressure though. A3, now Queen F2, and F3 is now under fire as well. As well as Queen D2, maybe as a threat. And Rook D2, of course. So White actually played Rook E1 here, and now Rook D2 was the final move of the game. So White clearly didn't put up a very clinical defense here. It's all been kind of mowed down so um that was that was where white resigned okay white resigned here so um that's pretty crushing um let's let's have a look in overview and summary at that so uh okay so uh king's engine played very dynamically So three pawns offered here. White casting queenside does offer a nice target. So one pawn, two two pawns coming up, and a third pawn coming up. Three pawns down, but with strong kind of pressure on on the white king. Okay, so there's tempo gainers that exist in the position. So the rook is a tempo gainer. The queen is another tempo gainer, and it gives black continually more comfortable attacking squares. You know, all sorts of attacks are made possible. And um, now it seems, you know, white can, felt compelled to sack the exchange um, because it, I don't know, what, what, what would be the threat here if king 
b1 if that exchange that wasn't played then um possibly just the b fold looks pretty deadly just rook b8 looks pretty nasty on b2 okay so rook takes d3 and ex attempt to extinguish some pressure but uh, it persisted okay all right so um do you want to have a look at one more game or should we leave it for next week um quite a few of you have left on the chess base server anyway but we could leave it for next week now this has been an hour and 10 minutes i don't know if um uh <clears throat> okay um okay um basically the, the, okay there the was an interesting Lloyd's Bank game against Stuart Conquest in 1989 where I saw David Bronstein at the Lloyd's Bank Masters and my good friend Paul Georgia actually took a actually beat David Bronstein in one round but this is one of David's better games in that tournament so Lloyd's Bank Masters 1989 fond memories of this tournament I used to play in it two or three years in succession okay so playing black David played a Kara Khan and this binds variation which is quite annoying to discourage d5 so um, okay so now d5 was played anyway and white is temporarily a pawn up the question is can white hold on to the pawn here it was shown at some cost actually to hold on to the pawn <clears throat> um, so white does everything to protect the pawn in fact even knight g2 as though knight f4 if needed to protect the pawn so this is quite an exaggeration to protect this pawn and black is also trying to attack the pawn to regain it <clears throat> okay so d4 knight g7 so white carries on protecting the pawn and black again threatens as though to put more pressure on it so interesting <clears throat> and also there might be a6 i'm losing my voice i think this has to be the last game my voice is losing here okay so a4 trying to bind on b5 bishop b7 Queen b3 so both sides big debate about d5 being weak or not so this kind of a lot of attack and defense going on here spectacular position in its own right really rook b8 as though maybe you know bishop a6 bishop a8 a6 b5 bishop e3 in fact a6 without the need for bishop a8 because if takes then bishop d5 so rook f c1 and now a little surprise actually that um black plays on on the king side so um you know g5 uh the knight's dislodged h6 we have here access potentially to h2 and f2 via knight g4 which should also put pressure on d4 and white lashes out actually with um h4 the move h4 so undermining black's king safety okay and if it takes you know maybe knight f4 again protecting the pawn b5 and fireworks now we have a fireworks situation okay so what is going on here a b a b bishop goes back is black gaining the pawn finally he can't just get that pawn back he plays b4 first 
and this is getting horrible actually now because bishop d5 would be attacking the queen and putting pressure on the diagonal or knight takes d5 it looks as though this has gone wrong for for white he takes on g5 and plays knight a4 and black finally is getting the pawn back is it at cost though is knight c5 going to be horrible Bishop takes g5 is also on. Queen d6, which introduces actually knight g4. Because h2 is a bit weak. With a knight here and not here, h2 is a bit weaker than usual. So knight g4 is on the cards. And in fact, that's what's played now anyway, even with the knight blocking h2. Because also f2 is a bit weak. These two squares being poked into. And d4 is now under fire. Okay, so bishop e2, and now a great move. I wonder if you can spot it if I give you uh, 20 seconds starting from now. What did black play here? 20 seconds starting from now. Okay, yeah, some of you are guessing it. Knight takes f2. It's a bit crushing because of this bishop takes d4 idea. It's going to really expose uh, the king because g3 is a bit weak. So queen f3 ignoring it, but now it's all collapsing. Bishop takes d4 anyway. White tries to counterattack with knight f5. But now a bishop sacrifice, knight g4 check, offering the bishop because the queen's going to come in. And it will be mate if knight takes d4 here this will be mating check and this this will be mate but uh white's lost this lost the plot here he plays king f1 and unfortunately knight h2 check and it's going to be checked to win the queen after king e1 and then the queen can move so white resigned here knight h2 check final move of the game crushing so it all started with this debate about whether the pawn was going to be regained or not. Let's have a look at that game again. So very strange as though the initial debate was about this pawn, but the, the attention seemed to shift to White's king side after this g5. It seems this provocation for White to play h4. These guys, f2 and h2, were starting to get a bit weaker, it seemed in this game um, after black collected the pawn and gave up g5 but this queen d6 and knight g4 make an entrance now so bishop takes g5 pawn up again you know one two three one two three four pawn up again but queen d6 iron grip on f4 no bishop f4 because this beautiful knight has been established and knight g4 looks like danger so knight g3 knight g4 anyway how does white defend this if bishop e3 just takes and then takes here because if it takes there's taking on here so white's too loose on on the king side it seems this queen is not helping matters over here for the king It all goes downhill very rapidly now after bishop e2. So knight takes f2. I don't know what to suggest for white. What do we suggest for white? You know, there's a threat of bishop takes d4. There's a fr there's, there's loads of threats here. Um, so queen f3 was tried. Bishop d4, knight f5. And this is crushing finish, knight g4. Check. Discovered check. King f1, knight h2 check. End of game. So that was a great game from Lloyd's Bank Masters 1989. <clears throat> uh, 
so um all right um actually there's 17 of you on my stream all of a sudden i don't know if more of you are coming at this time or something uh, i mm, i did have one extra game in reserve we've gone over a few do you want one more game or should we uh should we go for next week Um. Okay, okay, just one more. This is it. This is the final game. A surprising and deep positional breakthrough in this game we're about to see. The most interesting part of the game starts with White's 40-second move, trying to sacrifice an exchange in order to achieve a seemingly sterile blocked position. Okay, so this is a classic. It's also in David Bronstein's book, The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Very interesting game. Uh, so he's black. And actually he plays what we, we could say is a really trendy Leningrad Dutch, which we've seen in the Tatar still, where Aronian beat Nakamura in. A Leningrad Dutch, believe it or not, in 1963. 1963. This is this should remind you of, of, of Nakamura game a bit. Look at this. Leningrad Dutch. So this C six is often the prelude to you know this sort of thing. Yeah? That's the kind of plan usually. Queen C two. King H eight. Of course the modern treatment is I think Queen B three with pressure on Queen side. Um Queen C two may be a bit passive, King H eight. Um B3. Okay, so knight a6, and the knight reroutes to c7. After rook ad1, bishop d7. E3 now queen e8. So this e5, e4 is kind of thematic in the Leningrad. Rook f e1. Rook d8, not playing for e5 immediately. Rook d2. Knight h5. Now white plays d5. And black just sits there. He doesn't doesn't play c5. He doesn't commit to c5. He just plays queen f7, actually. D takes, b takes. And black's getting kind of central pawn mass. Knight e2. Offering to try and weaken the black king. c5. Controlling d4. Knight f4. Now you might be tempted to take, but you know, takes and white's got pressure. But actually, knight f6 was played. This is 1963, this game. USSR 1963. Bro Brozoka. Stefan Brozoka as white. So knight g5 and the queen tucks away on g8. Bishop c3. Rook d e8. Bishop a5 attacking the knight. The knight moves to e6. We're going to get some relief in the position, some simplification. More simplification. Queen d3. Knight e4. Queen's now come off. So is this game heading for a draw? Lots of simplification and even more simplification after bishop c3. Are we heading for a draw? Knight versus bishop and two rooks each. Knight e4, the rook moves to b2. Now we get a lockdown on this b4 break. Black plays now a5 to lock down b4. f3. The knight goes back. King f2. Some pressure building up on the B file. Doubling rooks, maybe. E5. Now, one problem is revealed, one slight problem, is that this bishop is kind of hemmed in now after F4, because now E4, has the bishop got many squares? These pawns on the light squares, this bishop hasn't got much scope. But is it enough to win this position? 
we see some technique moves now to to clamp down on the king side now a4 but after rook a b1 blocking the position with a3 the king comes to guard d6 offering an exchange tack to get a completely blocked position so the knight if it takes there'll be no entry points at all look if knight takes d5 rook takes d5 we can agree no no hang on that's too dangerous I think in this position what why it has to be careful actually maybe C takes D3 um, because Rook takes B3 might be a threat if we look at this position Knight takes D5 if Rook takes D5 no this is fine as well the Rook can come back so I'm just seeing ghosts there but how would black win this position here is this winnable this position probably not is it because the rooks have no, there's no breaks here the breaks have all gone would you agree so anyway he doesn't do that he doesn't take that rook he keeps his knight he reroutes his knight he goes knight e8 so we get this knight maneuver to b4 actually it goes to b4 and then again we get this blocks position which again seems to be a draw is it going to be a draw rook a6 rook d1 nothing's going on surely in fact this exchange sack is still on with a seemingly blocked dead draw position he does take it here and now the rook sack which earlier seemed impossible is actually played here rook takes b3 so clearly white doesn't want to play a takes because of a2 with advantage to black you know the the, the rooks gonna come and munch these pawns so what what has david done he's king takes b3 as a whole bishop down here he's he's basically sacked to be a whole bishop down but he's got check and now we start to see some horror that actually after check king c1 rookie two this is really bad bishop here this pawn's dropping and this could, pawn could drop so if i asked you what side you prefer here if i give you 20 seconds starting from now what side do you prefer white or black 20 seconds to have a look at this position white or black starting from now a lot of you are saying black <clears throat> it looks to be a bit downhill for white here because this bishop's not really the best bishop in the world on b1 so um rook d1 starts munching pawns c falls also dropping so we've got our space invaders ready these three connected past pawns they're coming down the board g3 is also going to drop again or is it nope not yet so now the king maybe can start marching c4 king's not even needed it does come up a bit now rook h1 so we've got three connected pass pawns the rook's gonna make sure the king's gonna be passive check the king's also coming in to the position check and he doesn't mind dropping c4 here he plays d3 dropping c4 leaving him with two menacing pass pawns so now this this idea of check and one of the pawns moving forward seems a bit crushing actually so king g1 e2 sacrificing the rook to get this beautiful position well he's queening anyway he doesn't need to do anything but queen and here <coughs> why it resigned so the interesting thing about this game which was noted on wiki is as as mentioned that it was from a seemingly blocked drawish position uh, that was surprisingly deep positional breakthrough occurred 
let's have a look at the game again in overview and summary then so the Leningrad Dutch was the scene set and we had um, a lot of exchanges then a flurry of exchanges in this game uh, starting with knight e6 here uh, so the minor pieces started coming off the Queens came off more bishop more bishops came off knight bishop versus two rooks each then we have this blocked position where white is cunningly offering this exchange sack pretty soon to really just close all roads in the position now rook d5 it wasn't taken so that's the first point the rook wasn't taken here instead this knight is destined for this b4 square by here 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 <clears throat> so we see that maneuver in action and then we see rook a6 which is preparing now knight takes d5 the rook has no reverse movement it's blocked in by its own rook can't go in reverse whoops knight takes d5 actually might be useful here whoops and it's used unfortunately the rook's one move away from coming out but it's taken now and you might ask what about hang on what about c takes d rook takes d5 was played in the game what about c takes d5 did we have a look at that what happens here it looks as though in this position actually black has a new resource the weakness of the last move I think c4 c4 is possible here you see if b4 then we have uh, rook a4 or rook b6 we pick up b4 wouldn't we if king takes we have entrance points now we have the c file so just maybe rook here and go back to the c file you know into c3 to attack e3 we have entrance points so white wants to keep it closed with rook takes d5 maybe f fearing c4 from black but unfortunately the rook sacrifice rook takes b3 so it looks pretty good this rook sack it got loads of pawns and um, free connected past pawns coming through secured the victory even two connected past pawns utterly decisive here okay okay that's it from me this week hope you enjoyed that um, I'll upload it to YouTube comments or questions on YouTube later um, so check out YouTube com Kings Crusher hope you enjoyed this week and got something from it thanks very much Okay.